What will a philosopher write before he dies? How will he face his inevitable death? He went from being a high-ranking magistrate, to being a prisoner awaiting death. He was a devout Christian, and a speculative philosopher. Dante took inspiration from his works to write the Divine Comedy. Queen Elizabeth I personally translated his works. He was the last philosopher of ancient Rome. Boethius. Sometimes we also refer to him as Boethius. Boethius came from a prominent Roman family, the Anisi family. This family had produced two Roman emperors, and many magistrates. Boethius studied ancient Greek from a young age, as well as Greek philosophy. In the academic world of the Middle Ages, he enjoyed the same high esteem as Aristotle. At the age of 25, he had already become a member of the Senate. At 30, he became a magistrate during the Ostrogothic Kingdom period. Due to false accusations by political enemies, he was accused of plotting against the Eastern Roman Empire. He was imprisoned in a jail in Pavia, and was ultimately sentenced to death by the Senate. During the days awaiting execution in prison, he wrote this, the work, The Unattained of Philosophy, that has been popular across Europe for nearly 8,000 years. This book is divided into five volumes in total, mainly discusses the fate of humanity, the highest happiness and goodness, the nature of evil, the relationship between fate and human free will. In the first volume of the entire book, we can see Brutus writing, white hair inappropriately scattered on my head, skin sagging around me tiredly. When I complained with tears streaming down my face, the figure of a woman stood above my head, her appearance was full of dignity, her eyes shone like fire, her insight surpassed everyone. According to Brutus's description, although this lady is advanced in years, her skin is still in good condition. The long robe on her is finely made, but it looks worn out. In one hand, she held many classic books, while in the other hand, she held a scepter. She arrived at Brutus's prison cell. Brutus affectionately referred to her as Madame Philosophy. Yes, this character actually is the one depicted by Brutus. This noblewoman is a painter of philosophy, engaged in many speculative dialogues with Brutus in the book. When she faced the disappointed Brutus about fate, the philosopher lady said, as the philosophers of the Stoic school proclaim, humans cannot control most of what happens to them. Our fate, to a large extent, is held by a very charming goddess. The goddess referred to here is actually the Roman goddess of fate, Fortuna. Regarding the image of the goddess of fate, we can find it in many arts, sculptures, and coins in Rome. Usually, she holds a cornucopia in her left hand filled with fruits and luxuries, symbolizing her bestowal of fate upon people. Her right hand rests on the handle of a ship's rudder, symbolizing her control over people's fate. So, the left hand usually represents luck and wealth, while the right hand represents unavoidable disasters. Brutus intervenes here in the image of the goddess of fate. Obviously, it is trying to explain to us. Destiny is unavoidable. Even those lucky gifts will be bestowed upon you. Please do not easily believe. These gifts are what you deserve. Or rather, these gifts can be controlled by you. People need to be prepared at all times. Always turn to this goddess of destiny. Return those fortunate gifts, such as our love, family, children, reputation, career. These things related to happiness. In the eyes of Brutus, none of them are what we should truly believe in unquestionably, because they can disappear at any time. Regarding Fortuna's gifts, the philosopher lady said, I know that monster. I also know his deceptive methods. I know how he lures others and tell his sudden departure, plunging them into unbearable suffering. The philosopher lady reminded Brutus, as a wise person, must learn to reject believing in fate's gifts. Through this, she painted a picture of the wheel of fate for Brutus. Everyone is in success in gifts, between punishment and pain, rotating between each other. The rotation of the wheel of fate is completely random and merciless. And what the goddess of fate enjoys is precisely those who a few hours earlier, we're full of confidence in the future or self-satisfied people's screams. Just as the goddess of fate said, Inconsistency is my nature. The rotation of the wheel of fate is a game I never stop playing. If you wish, you can also stand on my wheel. But when you fall, please do not think of it as harm. These are my rules of the game. Because fate is commemorated with tears and unrest. The philosopher lady expresses about this. Only the most foolish in the crowd would try to stop the wheel of fate from turning, because they always pursue things that do not belong to them. Fate can take away anything. Because you must know, in human affairs, nothing is eternal and unchanging. If you have something you never want to lose, but can never take it away, 
Like wealth. It may just be a moment. That can leave you with nothing. The choice of not loving riches is to retreat into the castle of one's own heart. He believes that here, one can remain beyond the control of fate, maintaining the minimum self. Regarding fate's plunder of wealth, the philosopher lady says, wealth will never make a person lose everything. On the contrary, losing wealth may help us find a completely different happiness. Especially a person's ability to think and reason. This kind of happiness allows a person to come into contact with the mysteries and complexities of the universe. A true philosopher must always transcend the immediate environment. In dealing with one's own destiny, one must remain indifferent towards the forces of history and nature. One must acknowledge them. In conclusion, Nietzsche believed that people do not need to seek happiness externally because no external thing can be higher than human nature itself. True happiness instead lies within a person's heart and in a person's thoughts. In this book, we can see Brutus revealing his current situation in distress through conversations with the philosopher lady, ultimately finds freedom in faith. In this process of speculation, Brutus also transitions from initial despair and distress to acceptance of death and destiny. From this work, interview, to the interview, within interview, we can see Brutus's thoughts from the initial despair and misery transformed into a calm acceptance of death and fate. From this work, interview, until the subsequent renaissance. Within this period of over a thousand years, this book was one of the most influential works throughout Europe, as one of the most influential works, to the extent that in the 10th to 12th centuries, it was known as the Boethius era. As the last Roman philosopher proficient in ancient Greek, he was also seen as a cultural bridge between Greece and Rome. Likewise, he was also the turning point for Europe, from the era of ancient Greek and Roman culture, towards the turning point into the era of Christian culture. The life of Boethius. Boethius had a rich body of work. Apart from the fields of philosophy and theology, he even delved into mathematics, works in fields like geometry and music. Besides this, he also translated many works of Aristotle and Plato into Latin, translated into Latin, even the original geometry of Euclid. The mechanics of Archimedes, the music of Pythagoras, all these knowledge were translated by him into Latin and introduced to the Romans. It can be said that without Bruges, there would be no Cicero. Perhaps it would be difficult for us to imagine the many cultural treasures of ancient Greece and Rome, how they were discovered during the Renaissance, by people. Returning to the contemplation of fate itself, in different public opinions, or different common contexts, we may have different understandings of fate, but we tend to lean heavily towards interpretations that provide a sense of security. Human contemplation of fate, from earlier pessimism tinged with fatalism, gradually in history, moved towards a modern scientific optimism, influenced by the context of today's era. We always crave expressing views that are more mainstream in front of the public, views that are more easily accepted by others. We consult ancient texts. We cite classics. We rely on explanations more knowledgeable than ourselves, with more authoritative explanations, to gain trust in ourselves and in others. What I want to say is, even if there is a valuable reference answer, we also need to know that the answer itself is not standard. We also need to temporarily accept those non-standard answers, including our non-standard thinking. We need to allow them to be crooked, written in our minds. But what is fate? I think we should leave this question for us to think about together. Follow me to take a popular look at philosophy. Friends, see you next time.